Hello, guys, and welcome to the Disciple Podcast. Today, I have Frank Viola with me, who is a conference speaker, a blogger, and also a best-selling author. And he helps serious followers of Jesus know the Lord more deeply so they can experience real transformation and make a lasting impact. And Viola's blog is regularly ranked in the top five of all Christian blogs on the web and his podcast. And Christ is all has ranked number one in Canada and number two in the USA on iTunes. And his Insurgents podcast features discussions with his conversation partners on the explosive gospel of the kingdom. Join us on the Disciple Podcast and experience a unique journey of faith that will open your eyes to how Jesus is working in the lives of ordinary people. By hearing stories of those who have gone before us and are walking with us, it is our hope that these conversations will ignite a passion in our listeners to take up their own cross and follow Jesus. Frank? Welcome to the podcast. It's great to be on, Patrick. I appreciate you having me um, show up on your show. I I started reading and listening to your content, I think, two years ago. And I got to say, the book, The uh, the Insurgents, that's probably what gave me a radical view of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, just like you mentioned, you know, how come that lots of terrorist organizations and these things, they... They're radical in their beliefs to the point of death, but yet we as Christians usually don't want to leave the pews. And that just gave me a whole uh, grip on and really just opened my eyes to see that there's a lot more. And you really shared a lot of burdens for the church in that book. So what, 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 is, what is your burden for the church just to maybe give the listeners a, a bird's eye view? Well, I'm going to have to ask a question before I answer that. Because in order to answer it properly, I have to get clear on uh, the word church, what you mean by church. For example, are we talking about the evangelical church? Are we talking about the Protestant church, the Roman Catholic church, the Orthodox church? Are we talking about all the Christians in the world? Uh, what exactly do we mean by church? And, and I'm asking this question for a couple reasons. Uh, one of them is that I want your listeners to know that when the word church, which is the translation in English from ecclesia, is used in the New Testament, it almost exclusively refers to a local body of believers that assembles together. There's only uh, one exception to that in the book of Ephesians. But even in that exception, it still means an assembly. It's just the heavenly assembly. Um, and so, so I have to ask you, Patrick, before I could really properly answer that, what do you mean by church when you ask me, what is my burden for the church? <laughs> That's a good question. So I mean the body of believers, the body of Christ who come together in any shape or form, whether that's a building or a house or, okay. yeah, that's, so it's the, the spiritual body of, okay. yeah. Okay, so we're talking about all the Christians in the world, irrespective of uh, belief, or irrespective of location, irrespective of gathering. We're talking about the body of Christ. That's okay. Right. Well, my my answer to that, and I appreciate you being clear on that, is to give me to give your listeners context uh, and understanding of of, of my answer. Uh, I have to give a little background. So I came to the Lord. I believed on the Lord. I gave my life to Christ in the Assemblies of God denomination. And I was rather young. Um, I was in my preteens um, before I was 13, probably 12, around there, 11, 12. After that, I got involved with, with the denomination known as the Church of Christ, which it claims to be a non-denomination. <laughs> it's a denominational that's non-denominational. Um, and then I got involved in the Pentecostals, uh, more so uh, beyond the Assemblies of God, Church of God. Um, then moved to the Charismatic Movement from Open Bible to Word of Faith to the Vineyard. And then it was the Southern Baptist, the Independent Baptist, the Reform, the Church of Christ. I already mentioned that this Christian Missionary Alliance, the Lutheran Church, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, Navigators, InterVarsity and many evangelical churches that were non-denominational. And against all of that, I would say this, my burden has been to help restore what is lacking in all of those denominations based on my experience. 
uh, and that is the eternal purpose of God, what Paul calls the eternal purpose. And a big part of that eternal purpose is what Jesus referred to as the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Paul talked about the gospel of the kingdom. Paul preached it. Peter preached it. Philip preached it. All the apostles preached it. And uh, related to that, Patrick, is the living, breathing expression of Jesus Christ in her, in her, in her organic, native expression, um, meaning the body of Christ in its original expression uh, in every culture. Every culture is going to look slightly different, but it still has the same DNA, and there's going to be characteristics that do not change across the board. And what we see today in most churches, whatever the denomination, whatever the movement, whatever the, the stripe or camp or tribe, looks very different from a living, breathing, organic expression of the body of Christ. And the other thing, I guess I would say, adding to this burden, because all these things work together, the eternal purpose, the gospel of the kingdom, the body of Christ in her organic expression, is the role of the apostolic worker as envisioned in the New Testament. Uh, because that person is critical to all of the things I'm talking about. And uh, also, it would be the central thrust of New Testament revelation, which is the centrality and supremacy of Jesus Christ and the matter of living by his indwelling life. And in my experience and observation, Patrick, all of those themes that I just mentioned were grossly lacking in all the groups <laughs> that I said at the front, all the movements, all the parachurch organizations, all the denominations. And uh, all of these themes uh, that I just outlined are found in my 20 plus books, over a thousand blog posts and three podcasts that I have created. And that, brother, is my burden. And uh, the, the thing I would say on top of all that is to see some young, called people raised up to God's work the exact way they were raised up in the first century, uh, properly prepared, properly trained, and properly sent. And that particular way, the way that God raised up workers and sent them out in the first century has basically been lost to us. It is very, very different from the way that most people are prepared, trained, and sent today. Uh, drastically different, I would say. So that would be an additional point <laughs> that I would make as a postscript to, uh, to how I answered that question. But I hope that's clear. Yeah, that's good. So going through all those different denominations and different camps in the body of Christ, what, what led you on this journey? Like what, what made you move out of all that and, and start this, this journey talking about the gospel, of the kingdom, deeper things of Christ, the organic church life? How, how did that start? Well, all of the uh, different um, groups that I have been a part of and I mentioned many of them, uh, always gave me something valuable. I always took away something of value. But after a while, each of them left me with a cry in my heart. And that cry was, there must be more than this. Okay, so I would go through one movement, one denomination. I would, get, I would, I would be all in with it. And then after a while, um, there was that heart cry. There's got to be more than this. And uh, that's, the, that's the impetus for what I call the deeper journey, which is the tagline for my ministry. And anybody listening to this, if they want to get more information on what I mean by the deeper journey in the Christ is All podcast, which is on all platforms, episode 149 is called What is the Deeper Journey? And I give an example of a 32-year-old, I believe he's 32, um, individual who represents myself and so many other people uh, of the odyssey that they were a part of that led them to what I mean by the deeper journey. So that's the first thing. There was that heart cry, there must be more than this. The second thing is, since I have been on what I call the deeper journey, it was my experiences of true, authentic, Christ-centered body life. The life of the body of Christ 
and the discoveries that I made about the Lord Jesus in those experiences and in that expression. And, uh, and again, if, if anyone is interested to learn more about what I mean by that, they can just be, they can begin to read my work because I talk about it in just about every book I've written and all of my articles. Um, but I made discoveries about the Lord and his church, his ecclesia, his body, um, that were mind blowing to me, Patrick, and that were life altering. And that experience and those encounters and those, uh, those particular journeys that I have been on um, are the impetus of everything that I put out. Basically, I share and I put in print or on audio that which has changed my own life. And so it's a way of paying it forward. Um, and that's really the motivation behind it all. So going through all those different things, I'm sure you've heard a lot of... Uh... I, would, I don't want to say different Gospels, but a lot of variations of the Gospel, you know, where one is about the death and resurrection, one is about signs and wonders, uh, which which are all are part of the Gospel, but it's perhaps it's not the Gospel. So what, if you would have to describe the Gospel, how would you describe it? Oh, well, you have nine weeks. <laughs> um, Jesus called it the Gospel of the Kingdom. Paul called it the gospel of grace, but it is the same message of good news. It's also known as the everlasting gospel, the gospel of God, and many other names for it, but it's all the same gospel. And it really cannot be distilled into a soundbite without diluting its power. Uh, I wrote an entire book unfolding it. You mentioned it, Insurgents, the Gospel of the Kingdom. And if listeners would read that book, they will get a full understanding of my, under, of, of my apprehension and my comprehension of what the gospel is. I believe that the gospel of the kingdom is the quote-unquote full gospel. Now, I was brought up in a movement that said we have the full gospel, and all that meant was they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He rose again from the dead. If you believe in him, you'll go to heaven. And also you can speak in tongues <laughs> and you'll, you'll have God's power, um, which, by the way, is not the case. Uh, I believe in speaking in tongues, but you can speak in tongues and not have a scintilla of the power of God. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that many of the versions that we've heard concerning what the gospel is, uh, the Roman road, the famous Roman road, I don't know how prevalent that is taught today, um, but it was very popular when I was a young believer. You, you go through the book of Romans and, you know, you're shown you're a sinner and now you have to believe and look at these passages from Romans uh, or another very popular version of it was the four spiritual laws. And, uh, and a lot of it has been distilled down to, you know, believe in Jesus, say this prayer and you won't go to hell, you go to heaven. Um, Eternal life is certainly a part of the gospel, but it is a part. It's an part. It is not the main part. And uh, it's so much more than that. It's so much bigger. It's so much more glorious. And that's why I, I wrote a book on it. Um, but I think most of us, Patrick, have heard a truncated, watered down version of the gospel. I know I did. Um, it's enough to get a person saved uh, very often if they respond to it and they make contact with Jesus Christ, but it's not enough to transform them for sure or bring them into God's eternal purpose. And uh, in every movement, denomination, parachurch organization, uh, parachurch organization, uh, that was the case as well. Uh, it, it's, it's getting people converted is just getting them through the door. And the kind of gospel preached is going to produce the kind of convert made. And one of the reasons why we see such failure, such weakness, uh, so much insipidness in modern-day Christianity is because of the gospel that's preached. It, pro it produces a certain kind of convert. But the gospel of the kingdom, properly understood, not just as a term, um, I think it's important to understand, Patrick, somebody could say they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, or someone can profess, hey, we need the gospel of the kingdom, but means something very different from what it meant in the New Testament, or 
say, for example, what I mean by that term. Um, but, you know, I'm more interested in God's full intention, his full gospel, his eternal purpose, what Paul called the full counsel of God. And that is very much tied into uh, the gospel of the kingdom or the insurgents, as I call it. Yeah, when, when I had a revelation of the gospel of the kingdom, it, it wrecked me. <laughs> it totally wrecked yeah. me because yeah. it just puts you into a place where you can't say no. Like you want more of Christ. You want to live him out. You just want to go deeper because it just gives you such a glorious picture. You know, and we have in the gospel, uh, in the body of Christ, we can have two extremes, right? We have the lawlessness, the license to sin, and then we have legalism. So mm -hmm. we have these two extremes. Mm -hmm. And Frank, how would you describe, or how would, how would someone know they're living in legalism? And how mm -hmm. would someone come, come out of it? Yes. Well, you mentioned what I call the two enemies of the gospel, um, legalism and libertinism. And many Christians think that legalism basically is reduced down to this idea that we have to work to receive salvation. We have to work to receive God's grace. Um, that's one form of legalism, but it's not the main form that appears in the Christian world. The main form that legalism uh, takes in the Christian world is I have to work to make God happy. I have to work to be approved by him. I have to do better than I'm already doing. In fact, I have to be better than the best I can do to receive his favor and his love. That's what legalism looks like uh, in most Christian uh, groups. And anytime, you know, um, a Christian is told you have to do X, Y, Z after you're already converted. Now you're in Christ. Christ is in you. Anytime a Christian is told you have to do X, Y, Z, or you're not doing ABC and God's angry with you and he doesn't really love you. In fact, he doesn't like you. Uh, and that it's never usually stated that way, but that's the message. Um, then that person is being preached legalism and Legalism and guilt go hand in hand. Now, guilt is very different from the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Um, guilt is a very powerful tool, and many preachers use it to condemn God's people and to try to motivate them. But Jesus Christ came to deliver us from guilt and condemnation, not put it on us. Um, but the Spirit enlightening us, that's a completely different thing, and it's a freeing thing. And that comes with God's love and God's grace, and God's mercy. Um, and so it, it doesn't make us feel guilty. Um, it does the opposite. So in answer to your question, the two enemies of the gospel, we have legalism and libertinism. And those two enemies are with us today, just as they were in the first century. Paul of Tarsus had a battle, both of those enemies, in the first century. And you can, you can pick apart all of his letters together and you could see especially his letters to the assemblies the ecclesias you could see whether or not he's dealing with libertinism <laughs> or legalism so for example when he writes to the galatians he's dealing with legalism when he writes to uh, the corinthians he's dealing with libertinism and on and on it goes um but i would say this the libertine believes we are under grace so we could do whatever we want God's cool with it. He is love, you know, so it doesn't matter what we do. The legalist, on the other hand, believes my personal convictions reflect God's opinions. So if it's wrong for me, it's wrong for you. And by the way, I'm not a legalist, <laughs> meaning most legalists are not in touch with the fact that they're legalistic. Um, the libertine acts as if there is no God. The legalist acts as if he or she is God to everyone else. And as I've argued in the book Insurgents, most legalists are not in touch with the fact that they're legalistic. And the same is true with most libertines. They do not realize that they have been perverting God's grace into license, as the letter of Jude uh, makes plain or those are the words coming out of the new testament in the book of jude every legalist i've ever met patrick uh lives by a double standard 
You know, they may say, well, are you listening to the music of Adele? Well, she's an unbeliever, so she sings the devil's tunes. For example, you can insert anything else in there. Yet that same person who says those words or similar words, similar ones, loves television shows, movies, written, produced, directed, and uh, carried out by non-believers. And so there you have a double standard. And so a person does not have to be a walking, breathing Moses to be a legalist. Uh, but legalists basically have created God in their own image because he happens to say he happens to hate the same art that they do. Uh, and so this is what it looks like in the Christian world. And, you know, the way out of it, I guess I would say before we got into that is to look at the symptoms like. How does a person know that they're legalistic? And how does a person know that they're a libertine? Okay, so here are some of the symptoms. If you're a legalist, you're quick to judge others. If you hear gossip that someone has fallen or made a mistake, your response is not, oh, that could have been me. Lord have mercy. Instead, it's off with their heads. <laughs> um. If you feel like you're never doing enough to make God happy, that's another symptom of legalism, all right? So these are these are sort of the characteristics of legalism or kind of a litmus test to know if you're legalistic. There, there are more, but those are a few. Now, here are the symptoms of libertinism. You live in your flesh and your conscience does not seem to bother you. Uh, your carnal appetites control you and you're okay with that because, well, you know, God's love and he loves you. Um, and if you're a true convert, Patrick, a person who is deceived into living uh, a libertine life, who accepts the gospel of libertinism, there is a tremendous war going on inside of them. They are not at peace. And either the flesh is going to win out or the spirit is going to win out. And I have addressed this whole subject of legalism versus libertinism, the two enemies of the gospel in the book Insurgents. I have another book called Revise Us Again, and the other book is Jesus Now. And all three books deal with this extensively from different perspectives. But, you know, the way out is really to be presented with a cataclysmic, earth-shaking, unveiling of Christ in his glory, majesty, mercy, and grace. Because what that does to the legalist is it blows out of the water legalism. And one of the ways that I've seen it happen is in conferences and in meetings where I have delivered messages on the book of Galatians and, reveals, and revealed Christ through it, it sets so many of the Lord's people free. On the other hand, when Christ is revealed in glory and power, um, the libertine comes under the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, and they they begin to love the Lord as the Lord himself more than their flesh and their fleshly appetites. So it really comes down to this thing that I said in the beginning, <laughs> the first question, my burden for the church, the centrality, the supremacy, um, the unveiling of the riches and the glory of Christ. And that kind of preaching, that kind of unveiling, that kind of ministry is extremely rare today. It's extremely rare. And that's one of my burdens. And I would say um, it's one of my contributions to the body of Christ. So what would you say are the dangers of both of those extremes? Lawlessness and legalism or libertinism yep. and being legalistic. Yep. Well, if you're a Christian, if you're a true convert, it's going to stop your own personal transformation dead in its tracks. That's number one. The second thing it's going to do, it's, it's going to corrupt other Christians. Because any believer who's walking in a legalistic manner, that, that's going to infect other believers. Um, the same is true if they're walking in a libertine way. That's going to infect other believers. You know, these are diseases, really. they're spiritual diseases, they're spiritually transmitted diseases, I would say. Um, STDs, but spiritually 
transmitted or religiously transmitted. That's funny. And yeah, and both will kill any true expression of the body of Christ. You know, uh, libertinism just about destroyed and decimated the, the ecclesia in Corinth. Um, legalism just about destroyed the churches in Galatia, the assemblies in Galatia. Um, and both not only grieve the Holy Spirit, but they will steal a person's internal peace. They just raw their peace uh, robbers. They will take the peace away from any believer. So those are just some of the dangers, uh, some of the ways that these things corrupt. Yeah, I can I can attest to that. Um, when I was under under the law, pretty much. I wasn't able to get free from sin, but once I understood grace and I had a revelation of Christ, yes. then I, everything like just clicked and I was free. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, if you're in lawlessness, the sin can lead to death. So you have these both spectrums on yes. both sides. You're going to be in bondage. You're not going to be free. Yes. Well, I want to add something to that because it's counterintuitive. Um, many preachers lay the law down on God's people thinking that that's going to stop them from various sins, right? What ends up happening is the more the more the law is preached, the more legalism is proclaimed, the more sin breaks out. It's just undercover and hidden. Uh, the churches that I have known that had all kinds of gross sin rampant among the congregation, were churches that were super legalistic. Um, and all this stuff was going on, you know, behind the scenes. It just came out, you know, as it often does. And so, uh, you know, this is very much in, in, in alignment with what Paul said. Paul said, the strength of sin is the law. And if you read uh, Romans 7, you know, regardless of how you interpret that, you know, there are people who say, well, Paul's talking about himself before he was a convert. Paul's using an analogy. Paul's talking about the Jewish people who did not know Christ. However you interpret that. And the point is, the more a person tries, whether you're converted or not, to keep the law, the more you're going to realize how sinful you are. <laughs> and it's going to, in Paul's words, entice sin in the flesh. So, and this is something that a lot of Christians don't seem to understand. You know, they think, well, if you're, if you're really going to live above the power of sin, man, you have to feel guilty. You have to have that law, you know, uh, shoved down your throat. You know, you have to really try hard to obey God based on his word. Um, and basically, that is a railroad track to failure and even more sin. <laughs> so I just wanted to uh, double click on what you said, because that's exactly what happens with with legalism. That's right. Yeah, that's well said. So when you say the law, what law are you talking about? Is it the law of Moses? Yeah, well, see, here's the thing. Um, the law of Moses is essentially made up of 613 laws, and we find them in the Old Testament. But a person can make the New Testament. They can turn the New Testament into a law also. So you could take the well, words of Jesus and turn it into Torah. And this is one of the things that the great scholar F.F. F. Bruce warned against. You know, he said Paul would be turning over in his grave if he realized how many Christians have turned his words into Torah. Anytime I look at a statement in the Bible, whether it's Old and New Testament, and I say, God wants me to do this, so I'm going to go ahead and try to do it. You have now just moved into a legalistic frame of mind. Because number one, you cannot keep the law of God. Nobody can, all right? We in our natural power are incapable of carrying out God's will, all right? The other part of it, though, and this is the part that's so missing, is you and I cannot live the Christian life. Jesus himself said this. He says, without my father, I can do nothing. And he's the perfect son of God, right? Then he turns around and says to his disciples, without me, you can do nothing. The point is, 
No human being can live the Christian life. If you try to live the Christian life, you try to obey God's commands, whether Old New Testament, all right, you try to do, that's the key word, you try, you try, underline you and underline try, you try, you're going to end up in the experience of Romans 7. But if you turn the page over to Romans 8, what does he say? The spirit who lives in me, he fulfills the law. Paul says, it is not I, but Christ who lives in me, right? And so it's a matter of learning how to live by a different life. And the only life that can fulfill the law is the life of Jesus Christ. It is the life of God himself. And that life dwelled in Jesus of Nazareth when he was a man. He lived by his father's life. And then when he was resurrected, the passage moved from the Father to Jesus, to Jesus, to us. And then he gave us his spirit, and his own life is in his spirit, the same life that lived perfectly on this planet. And we, brother, are to live that life together. And that's where the assembly comes in. That's where the ecclesia comes in. I'm not talking about sitting in a pew listening to a sermon every week then going home living your life. I'm talking about a shared life, a community of people who are learning to live by the indwelling life of Christ together. That is how God's will is fulfilled. We can't do it in ourselves. We'll always fall short. We'll, we'll always fail. But if we're living by his life with other believers in a local context, we will begin to see the will of God fulfilled in our lives. And we can say with Paul, it is not I, but Christ who lives in me. And that is a missing note in Christianity today, my friend. It is a missing note. It is a rare message today. Amen. That's so good. So good. Praise the Lord. Um, how would you, so now that we're not under law, we're under grace, we kind of talked about here briefly, Romans 6, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. We're now living by the grace of God, Christ in us. Yeah. And it says, with the spirit, it says liberty, right? So, what does freedom in Christ mean? Well, freedom in Christ is not the same as freedom from Christ. <laughs> uh, I have met Christians throughout my life that went to seed on grace. In other words, they took the grace message and went off the rails with it and ended up in a deception that freedom in Christ meant freedom from Christ. <laughs> and in the New Testament, and you can find this in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, to be free from the law is to be free in Christ, and it is to be in law to Christ. So we're, we're kind of, you know, to use Paul's analogy, we're divorcing ourselves from the law. It's really not divorce. What happens is we die. And so now the, now the law is no longer married to us, but we rise again and we have a new husband, and that's Jesus Christ, not the law. All right. And it's a beautiful picture. and It's a powerful one. You know, I used to be married to the law, but now I'm married to Jesus and the law. I'm dead to the law. Um, but what freedom in Christ means to me is that as a genuine disciple of Christ, someone who has been born from above, who's truly been regenerated and has God's life dwelling in me. And I will just turn it to you. So I'm just not talking about myself. You and I are free. Listen now carefully. We are free to do anything we want. And God will still love us. His forgiveness will be available. All right. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are free to do things without consequence. So like, for example, you know, you, you take a father or a mother who has a child. And the child rebels. Well you know, that's going to dishearten the parents. It's going to hurt the parents. But the parents don't say, well, you're not my child anymore. They don't cut them off. They still love them, but there's going to be consequences. And so God's uh, consequences are built into the actions that violate God's will. The Lord hardwired punishments into his creation. 
And they represent what the New Testament calls the chastening of the Lord. This is in Hebrews and in Revelation. Just like the parent who has a wayward child is going to discipline and chasten the child, but they do it out of love. You know, it's it's the kind of thing where they still accept the child. They still love the child. They'll even forgive the child. But there's going to be a consequence, right? And so, you know, um, to put it to put it in drastic terms, all right. You as a believer in Christ, you're in Christ. He's in you. You're free to rob a bank, or if you want to, now, you'll probably be shot by a police officer, or <laughs> or uh, you're going to spend a great deal of your life in prison. But God's love doesn't change toward you. His acceptance of you doesn't change because his love and his acceptance is not based on your work. It's not based on your behavior. It's based on the work of another. It's based on the behavior of another, and that is his son. And this is, this is the meaning of being in Christ. If you're in Christ, what has happened, what has taken place in Christ is true of you also, right? So I'm going to send a uh, book to someone very soon. And I'm going to put that book in a package, and I'm going to seal that package, and I'm going to drop it off at the post office. Well, whatever happens to that package happens to the book, and whatever happens to the book happens to the package because the book is in the package. And that's a good illustration of what it means to be in Christ. Whatever happens to him happens to us. Whatever is true of him is true of us. And the other thing about it is we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Um, so I'll put it another way, and I'll, and I'll use myself as an example, okay? I am free to smoke marijuana and get high. I'm free to cuss. I'm free to drink until I can't see straight. These actions will not change God's love for me one bit. But the thing about it is, Patrick, I don't want to do any of those things because the Lord has changed my will. But I'm free to do them if I want in the sense that God is not going to withhold his love from me. He's still going to forgive me. And see, what that does is it makes me love him even more. It makes my appreciation, my worship of him, to even grow because I can say, Lord, even if I screw up, even if I make some really bad decisions, even if I do stupid things, things that violate your will, things that grieve your spirit, you're still going to love me because I'm your child. For me, Patrick, that makes me not want to do those things even more, you see? And so that to me is what um, freedom in Christ is means augustine is attributed is is attributed to saying love and do what you want <laughs> love god and do what you want love others and do what you want all of that is my view of freedom and the holy spirit does change our will and our desires praise his name yeah that's so true and <laughs> you know when i when i first heard heard this message that you just kind of uh, explained that I can do what I want and God's not going to change his opinion about me, but I'm not going to do it because I have a new, I'm a new creation. I have yes. a new, new, new desires. Yep. But once I understood this, it didn't, it didn't lead me to sit more. Right. It, it's, 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 it put me out of the bondage to being a slave to sin. And yes. it's almost like counterintuitive where you, where you think if someone doesn't understand this, they're going to hear it. They're going to think, you know, that doesn't work. But once you have a, re a revelation of it, it sets you free. And it's it doesn't make sense to a carnal mind. Right. Uh, it does now for me, but in the beginning it didn't. Yes. But then what, when you just pray and you just ask God for revelation and you, because we want to be free, right? We don't want to be slave to sin. We don't, we don't want to be slave to the law. We want to live in the freedom of Christ because this is how he's going to use it. We can't let Christ reign in us if we don't understand what he has done for us. And that's where the right. freedom comes comes in. Uh, right. Amen. So, Frank, how how do you see the church? What should it look like 
from a biblical perspective because lots of people that read, let's say they read Ephesians or Galatians, and because of the perspective they have right now of the church, they think okay, this letter was written to the church in Galatia and it was, you know, a church building and they were sitting there and <laughs> Paul wrote this letter to this church and then they opened it and they read it inside that building. But that's that wasn't the case, right? So how would you how do you see this from mm -hmm. a perspective maybe that you can maybe change for, for some people? Well, answering the question, how do I see the church? What should it look like biblically? I have to respond with another question. And that is, do you have 25 hours? <laughs> uh, it would take me 25 hours. Uh, do you have 25 hours? It would take me that long to uh, to answer this question adequately. I, I can tell your listeners this. I have written four books um, that answer this question in detail. And I'm going to give the names of the books. Reimagining Church from eternity to here finding organic church and then the last one insurgents um so if they're if they're coming at this from the question of well what's the kingdom of god they should read insurgents first insurgents reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom but if their main interest is what you asked what is the church biblically supposed to look like how did it function in the new testament and how it's how is it and how can it function today, then it would be reimagining church from eternity to here, finding organic church and insurgents in that order. Because all of those books give the answer. But I'm, I will just say this. The Christians did not build buildings, religious buildings. They did not have religious rituals. They did not have a, a special professional priesthood uh, that is a clergy until 300 years past. Uh, after the Christian faith started. And they did it intentionally. It wasn't because they couldn't build buildings, religious buildings. You know, um, the Jews had their religious buildings. The pagans had their religious buildings. They also had their special priesthoods. The Christians did not. In the first century, every believer was viewed as, and they saw themselves as a kingdom of priests all had ministry all were ministers all were priests unto god both men and women now everybody had a different function right and there were certain functions such as oversight uh there were other functions such as teaching but those were not a special class of people who were professionals who were paid by the other brothers and sisters to function everyone functioned and in the first century, they lived as communities. You know, they were in one another's lives. Uh, it was very close to what the tribe was, you know, in other parts of the world. And instead of having the chief of the tribe, Jesus Christ played that role, okay? Only he was invisible. And, and he still is invisible. And he worked through his body. But it was the body that took care of one another. It was the body that ministered to one another. Um, and so I point all this out in the book. I show all these scriptures that, that give us this picture um, of what the ecclesia was. You know, it was an alternative civilization on this planet. It was very different from the religious world of the Hebrews as well as the religious world, religious world of the pagans. And what's happened over time is that the religion of both Judaism and paganism uh, over time began to shape the Christian world, began to shape the Christians uh, and how they met together. And so today it looks very similar to what it did um, in, say, you know, the Jewish synagogue worship it wasn't like that in the first century. Um, and it also looks very similar to an American Western business, right? The way it operates. And, um, and so again, you know, those books go into detail and what, what I like too about these books and I, I did this intentionally is when someone's reading and I'm painting the picture, I'm showing you scripture after scripture. And by the way, the scriptures are in context. They're not lifted out of their local context. You can prove anything with verses by um, pasting them together. But 
these texts that are used in these books are taken in context. And, uh, and also I answer objections. And that was the intentional part of the book. I answer objections. Well, what about this first, Frank? You know, uh, how do you respond to that? And I give an answer. So these books together will present what the first century churches looked like. Uh, and I'm not talking about the way they dressed. You know, we're not talking about togas and sandals, but we're talking about the DNA of the ecclesia and how the body of Christ functions. And um, that transfers over to the 21st century. I have had the privilege of being part of um, assemblies that look very much like the first century churches. And what's so beautiful about it, Patrick, is that when we read the book of Galatians and 1 Corinthians and 1 Thessalonians and Philippians and Colossians, it's like we're reading our own mail because we were living in or we were living in the same dynamic environment, the same context that the first century Christians were living in. And it makes a whole lot of sense. But if you're not in that environment, you know, and you are a Christian who goes to church once a week and you sit in the pew and you listen to a sermon and you listen to the special music and you throw money in the offering plate and uh, you worship along with the worship team. And then you go home, but live your individual Christian life. That is not the context in which the churches in the first century lived, breathed and have their being had their being. And so you, you can't really apply a lot of it uh, to your context because it's so different from what it was in the first century. And, um, and that's not a necessity. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, that was the ancient church and we've developed. I don't think so. If a person has been part of some of the church experiences that I have been part of that met according to New Testament lines, uh, a living, breathing expression of the body of Christ, like you see in the New Testament, there is no way that a rational person would say, oh, well, what we have is a lot better. Uh, we developed beyond that. Now we sit in pews. We all face the same way. We listen to the preacher, and then we go home and live our individual lives. <laughs> that is not an improvement. Um, I've never met a person who actually met with one of these groups who ended up saying that. It was the exact opposite. This has blown my mind, is what they say. Um, I feel like I'm home now. I want more of this. But it, it really depends, too, on the uh, level of desire. You know, the, the way the church is done today, for the most part, suits a Western, busy person's life that sees church as kind of a, a supplement to their already busy lives. You know, I'm going to put in my two hours this Sunday and then I'm going to live my individual life. In the first century, in the New Testament, church was 24-7, all right? <laughs> you are part of this living, breathing community. It was an extended family, and you took care of each other, and you had each other's backs, and you were knowing the Lord together, and you were expressing Him together, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So, yeah, I would recommend those four books. That's how I would answer the question. That's just a little teaser or a little summary of of some of it yeah i've i've been part of some of those groups too just uh being more organic i don't think we're quite there yet but you know i i i definitely see and feel the difference it's way more interactive and christ is being displayed and christ is speaking through the body uh because he's the head mm -hmm. and it just changes the entire perspective of life and that this is a family, like you said, an extended family. Um, Frank, many people that listen to this to these episodes on the podcast, you know, one of their burdens is to bring the gospel, the kingdom, the eternal purpose of God to more people by, you know, going out, making disciples and these things. And in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, Jesus commissioned the disciples to go and and, and do that. Uh, in, in your eyes, how would how does someone uh, how would they live that out? Okay, this is an area. And, and, the, reason, and the reason I'm asking is because uh, you can make it very quickly about making disciples and lose the focus, which is Christ. 
himself. Mm -hmm. So, and I know you have a very good image of this, and I believe you were part of some movements too there. Yeah, so I'm just curious to see your, your view on it. Well, I think this is a great question, and it's a great topic to discuss because, you know, one of the things about my own ministry, and I've been called a provocateur um, and someone who challenges the status quo, but every once in a while, we need someone to come along and shake things up because as Christians, most of us are conditioned to believe certain things about uh, what the scripture teaches. And very often those things have been handed to us by human tradition. Um, and, and so we have a need for our eyes to be opened to see things differently. And when we see them differently and by differently, I mean through the spirit and um, with the intention that the, the writers of the new Testament had and what Jesus had in his mind and so forth. Once we uh, unsee those traditional understandings, you know, we can't go back and see them like that before uh, we see them in a new way. And that doesn't change unless we get reconditioned <laughs> by traditional teaching that is not correct. And then we go back to the same old, same old, you know, which is uh, so often off kilter. So I'm going to I'm going to do this step by step, Patrick, because I think it's a subject that really uh, needs to have some light shed on it. All right. Matthew 28, Mark 16, Jesus commissions the disciples to go and make disciples. All right. Well, there are a few problems, I think, we have with that statement itself and even with the question. First, Jesus did not commission all of his disciples in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. He commissioned and sent the twelve. That was to 12 men who had been with him and who had lived with him for three and a half years. And what Jesus was doing is he was training those 12 men to take his place when he left. And those 12 men were not just ordinary disciples. They were apostolic. They had an apostolic call. And Paul makes it very clear in the New Testament that not all are called apostles. Right. So we have to look at those 12 disciples, uh, minus Judas, of course, uh, as being apostolic. And what did they do? They were prepared and trained by the Son of God for three and a half years. After that training was over, Jesus is now sending them. And that is the true meaning of the word apostle that we use in English. Um, an apostle is a sent one, is one who is sent. Jesus was the first apostle. He was sent by his father. And what he did was he raised up the very first community of the kingdom. And that was that little band of 12 men and about seven women. And they were the embryonic expression of the ecclesia. All right. So we have a pattern in the first century that doesn't move. It's all throughout the New Testament that there are some who are called apostolic workers. They are prepared. First of all, they're called, right? Not everyone is called to this. They're prepared, they're trained, and they're sent. And what they do is they raise up kingdom communities or what we would call ecclesias or assemblies. All right, now, that great that's the first piece. The Great Commission, so-called, and that's not in the Bible. You know, men later called it the Great Commission, was given to 12. Here's the second piece. It was not a command. It was a prophecy. The Greek says, and you will be going, or as you go. He didn't say go. And many missionary movements have been built on a faulty understanding of that word to the 12. You know, they interpret it as go. So Jesus is telling all of us to go. We all have to be missionaries. We all have to leave our homeland. We got to go. Well, that's not what he said. <laughs> First, he was talking to 12 men, not all of his followers. Secondly, he said, as you go, as you're going, you can see this in Weist, for example, if you want to check it out. 
uh, we, the great Greek scholar. Um, so he was predicting that they would be moving. And apostles by nature are itinerant. They are mobile. And by the way, if any of your listeners are thinking, well, Frank, you know, there are no apostles after the 12. Well, Paul is called an apostle. Barnabas is called an apostle. Timothy is called an apostle. Uh, in my book, Finding Organic Church, I have a chapter where I biblically show all of the people in the first century who are called apostolic. And there's nothing in the New Testament that says that the apostolic role would somehow disappear or vanish. Um, if you're going to throw out apostles, you got to throw out teachers and you got to throw out pastors, <laughs> which are shepherds, um, by the way. And um, yeah, and so so the, there is no strong case that can be made to say that the apostolic ministry has somehow disappeared. All right. Now, as you were going and then he says, make disciples. Now, we have to ask a question, Patrick, and that is, what on earth is a disciple? What did Jesus mean by that? And I would say that for many of the Christian world, for much of the Christian world, many Christians have an answer to that question that really doesn't map with Scripture. All right, so let me try to unravel this, and this is how I understand it, and I would welcome anybody to challenge me. A disciple is an apprentice. A disciple is a student. A disciple is a follower. So a disciple of Jesus Christ is someone who, what, follows him, okay? Now, get the picture. If you're there in the first century and you're in Galilee and you've got these 12 men who are following Jesus, they're literally following him. I mean, you know, when he uh, travels to Samaria, they follow him there. When he goes to Judea, they follow him there. You know, they are walking in the same path. They're behind him, <laughs> as it were. And they're also seeking to model their life by his life. They're, in effect, um, imitating it, right? Um, and so that's what a disciple is. It's this apprentice who, in effect, is trying to become like his or her master. Now, what Jesus says in John 14, 15, and 16 is hugely significant. And I'm just going to paraphrase what he was saying. He was saying, you know, you've been following me. Everywhere I've gone, you've gone. You've been watching me. You've been trying to imitate me. But very soon, I'm going to go away. But the Spirit is going to come. And when the Spirit comes, I am coming in the Spirit. And no longer will you be following me externally. I'm going to take up residency inside you. And you are going to follow me internally. And because I'm going to be inside you, I can be inside all 12 of you. And even those who you bring the kingdom message to, and they respond to it, I'm going to dwell in them too, by the Spirit. And so it's actually better that I go, because what do you want? You want to follow me? You can see me with your eyes, but, you know, I'm limited by time and space when I'm in this mortal body or, you know, on earth, but I'm going to die and rise again from the dead, and I'm going to be immortal. And not only that, I'm not going to be captive to space and time. I can dwell in thousands of people at the same moment. But the way you're going to follow me is going to shift. You're not going to imitate me externally. You're not going to trace my steps externally. I'm going to live inside you, and you're going to let me live my life through you. And that's how you're going to follow me. So. Patrick, and I say this to all your listeners, the way that a disciple lives, the definition of a disciple is a person who is learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. And here is the big point. If that's true of a true disciple, if that's what a disciple is, how often do you hear anybody who's teaching about discipleship, 
having discipleship trainings, having discipleship programs, doing discipleship studies. How often do you hear any of them say, hey, here's what a disciple is. It's a person who's learning how to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. Here's how to do it. Well, I'll tell you what, brother, for years and years and years, I could not find one person who even understood that a disciple was someone who lives by Christ. Paul even said this. In Romans 8, he said, those who are led by the Spirit are the disciples of God, or the sons of God, right? Led by the Spirit. Well, if you're led, you're following. That's the point. Galatians 2.20, we say it again. It is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That's what a disciple is. And so it's not this external imitation. It's an internal indwelling. And the way that the Christian imitates Jesus Christ is by letting Jesus Christ live in the Christian and take shape in the Christian. So it's an internal imitation. It's not an external imitation. And then we have to come to the last point of all, and that is how are disciples made? So I've, I've had conversations with some of my colleagues and people who I've known throughout the years who are leaders. And I've asked them the question, you know, you talk about making disciples all the time. That's your emphasis. That's your thing. I said, that's great. How were disciples made in the first century? How was it done in the New Testament? How did Jesus do it? And how did the 12 do it? And brother, I would say that in every case, there was not a straight answer. There was not a clear answer. In some cases, there was no answer. Or when there was an answer is, well, you know, it's we're going to get together. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to get together and pray. We're going to get together and confess our sins. And we're going to do this every week. And that's what making a disciple is. Well, you can't find that in the New Testament. <laughs> None of that. And, and by the way, don't hear me to say I'm against reading the Bible. I'm not. I probably read the Bible more than most Christians. Don't read that, uh, hear that say I'm against prayer. I'm all for prayer. Um, and, you know, and confessing of sins has its place, although many Christians take that into an area where um, is outside of biblical uh, uh, principles. Um, and and that, and that also turns into a legalistic activity too in many groups. Um, but here's my point: um, how we pray is really the question. How we approach the scripture is really the question. But even that doesn't get to the issue of how disciples were made in the first century. So let's go back. Here Jesus is, he's in his resurrected state, he gets together with the twelve, he's in Bethany, he's going to ascend to the heavens, to the heavens, and he says, all right, as you're going, because you're apostles now, you're taking my place, you're going to carry on my work, make disciples as you're going, and, and do it, you know, do it all over the world. Start in Jerusalem, and then go to Samaria, and then go to all, all parts of the world, and uh, take this gospel message to the nations, to the Gentiles. It's not just to the chosen house of Israel. It's to the nations. Well, how did they make disciples? Well, the answer is obvious if you read the book of Acts with that question in mind. How did they do it? Brother, they preached the gospel of the kingdom, and they raised up the ecclesia, first in Jerusalem, then Samaria, and then throughout the nations, and Paul of Tarsus was, you know, the key guy there. He brought it all over the Gentile world. Um, he brought it to Galatia. He brought it to Greece. He brought it to Asia Minor, right? It was the raising up of these kingdom communities that disciples were made naturally and organically. You see, the kingdom community. In the first century, the ecclesia, the assembly, was the native habitat by which a Christian was made and grows into what God called them to be. And if you take a Christian out of that native habitat, 
that 24 seven community of shared life where everyone is participating, everyone is learning how to live by the indwelling life of Christ. Well, their transformation is going to go downhill real fast. Just like if you take an animal out of its native habitat, it's not going to function properly. And so the native habitat of the follower of Jesus Christ was the ecclesia. And that's how they made disciples. That's how the 12 did it. They went all over the world and they raised up these assemblies and they looked awfully similar to what Jesus raised up in Galilee with those 12 men and those seven women. Very, very similar. All right. It was uh, a community of shared life. And so that's my answer to the question. Um, what do you need for disciples to be made? You need apostolic workers who are properly trained, prepared, called first, and then sent out. And what are they sent out to do? To raise up the house of God, kingdom communities. And in that environment, disciples are made naturally. They don't need programs. They don't need systems. They don't need um, man-made traditions. They begin to live by the life of Christ if they're taught how to do it. And that's what apostolic workers do. They show them how to do it. And then they live in that community together and they begin to grow up in Christ. So that's my take on uh, Matthew 28 and Mark 16. <laughs> I know this is totally out of the box. It's not the typical view, but I would challenge anybody to refute it on biblical or scriptural grounds. And I can tell you by way of testimony that I have never seen a Christian grow in Christ faster and more thoroughly and more fully uh, than they have in that context, because I've watched and even participated in what I'm talking about. It's not just theoretical with me. It's practical. Yeah, that's good. I like it. Uh, what I think the biggest takeaway for me when I studied this topic was the apostles never went to go plant a church. They went, they went to wherever they went as they were going. Like I said, they preached the gospel of the kingdom. People responded to the message and then they raised them up so they can learn how to live the same life uh, with Christ. Uh, and then through that, the body was formed, right? They didn't go to planet church. It was birthed. Jesus gives birth to a church. So now it's planting one. Um, so what would you say that every believer should should make disciples? Or is that an organic thing that happens when you live by the indwelling of Christ? Yeah. So basically, you know, I, I would I would nuance what you said there about they didn't go to plant churches. I would say that's true in the sense they didn't go to plant churches the way we define church or the way that we in the West. Yes, that's right. I've experienced churches, but they did go. They didn't go to just give people fire insurance policy. Uh, you know, they didn't go to give people a fire insurance policy or a get out of hell free card. In other words, they didn't go to just get people saved. They went to raise up that kingdom community. And the way to do it is the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and then bringing a group of people together. And Paul was very strategic. He always looked for uh, people who had a house uh, in the first century because that would be the meeting place. And so he often went to well-to-do people in the pagan world, or if they were in the Jewish world in the synagogue, to seek to convert them so that their house could then be the meeting place of the ecclesia. So he was very strategic. You know, he had on his heart, I'm convinced, um, these kingdom communities. And that's why he was willing to, you know, suffer the way he did. It wasn't just to get people to heaven or give them eternal life. It was to see this, in Paul's view, it was this beautiful woman. The ecclesia in the eyes of Paul was a beautiful girl, the most beautiful girl in the world. And if anyone has ever experienced the body of Christ in the way that I've been describing, that's exactly what it is. It's a beautiful woman who bears image to her Lord, her beloved bridegroom. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about just a house church, like people who meet in a home and they 
you got somebody playing the guitar and they sing some songs and they eat together and they just talk about whatever's going on in their life. That's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what the first century churches were. There was something more glorious, more dramatic, higher. But without an apostolic worker who has actually experienced this themselves as a, uh, as a non-leader, they grew up in this kind of environment, just like the 12 did with Jesus. Um, just like Paul did in Antioch, you know, Paul was not an apostle until he was sent out, but he experienced years of body life with Barnabas, um, with the other brothers and sisters in Antioch. That was his training. That was where he learned what the ecclesia was. When, then when he was sent out, he was able to raise such a thing up. And I, I would say that Probably when it comes to the power of God outside of, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, outside of the creation of the entire universe uh, at the breath of God's word, the greatest display of power, the power of God is to raise up, to give birth to. Paul uses the term planting in 1 Corinthians 3, a local expression of the living body of Jesus Christ in a given area organically and to show that group of people first bring them in the door you know uh, which is conversion and then show them how to live by Christ together uh, and then to be able to lay such a foundation that they could leave this new assembly um, for months sometimes longer, and it still survive when fire falls on it. Um, and I'm quoting 1 Corinthians 3, but this is what you see Paul do. I mean, he raised up those churches in South Galatia, probably about four months, five months he was there in each of them, and then he left for a long period of time. Fire fell, but he built with gold, pearl, and precious stones. Same thing with the churches, the ecclesias in Greece, you know, Philippi. Uh, Thessalonica had major molten heat, you know, thrown on top of it. Um, you know, Berea, um, and then Corinth. And he raised them up in such a way, the foundation was so strong that he could leave. And oftentimes he was kicked out of town, except for Corinth. He, he was able to have a free hand there. He would be able to leave and and not be with them for months and then come back and they were still there. And he did not erect a clergy system. He did not appoint a pastor to you know, make all the decisions and, and rule the saints. That, that's not what happened. Um, but he had built with such intangible materials. Uh, Christ was the foundation. And he knew what that meant. And it was real and authentic that they survived. And true, genuine apostolic uh, work has that characteristic they can raise up a community of believers but truly knows the lord and is living by his life because they've been taught how loving one another uh handling problems together and that apostolic worker can leave for long periods of time and come back and they're still there meeting um it's quite a quite a mark to hit but that's what you see in the first century and i've experienced this myself in various uh, times in my life so um, you know, are all people, all Christians uh, called to make disciples? I don't see anything in the New Testament that would put it in those terms. What I see in the New Testament is that all Christians are called to live by the life of Christ. And they're to do it together in local communities. And out of that, there will be seasons where the whole assembly will go and reach out to the unbelieving neighbors the unbelieving world around them, like the church in Thessalonica did. And organically and naturally, not out of guilt, not out of duty, not out of religious condemnation, um, not out of fear. They're doing this organically, and it's in season, and they will go and present the gospel that has changed their lives with others. But the goal is not to just hand them a fire insurance policy and say, go on your way. It's to be part of that assembly. And that's where the discipleship is made. That's where disciples are made. That's where discipleship happens.
Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's it's more the emphasis is not to make a convert, make it because we can we can quickly uh, switch it from you know because the disciple is an apprentice, right? Who keeps on learning and growing in the Lord, but we can quickly use the word disciple where it's just a convert, and that's where it stops, where it's just the insurance policy. But really, it's it's way more than that. Right, and the the thing about the disciple is it's not just a a follower um it's a follower who follows the lord internally uh they who are led by the spirit are the sons of god you know um it's better that i go away so that i can come back and i will now dwell in you uh it is not i but christ who lives in me so if a person is going to tell me i'm all about making disciples I'm going to ask them, oh, really? How, how is it that you do that? Do you raise, are you an apostolic worker? Do you raise up ecclesias, assemblies, where people have a shared life 24-7? And have you shown them how to live by the indwelling life of Christ? And are they doing that together? Are they learning how to live by that life together? And are they expressing that life together in their gatherings? If the answer to that is no, which it usually is, then they're not making disciples the way the Bible talks about. <laughs> they're doing something else. And, and that's what I'm trying to communicate. You know, what I'm saying, it's, it's kind of tricky, Patrick, because anytime you present um, ideas that are revolutionary or radical or different, what happens is, and this is true for all of us, our brains will try to filter what we're hearing because it, it is different. We're trying to make sense of it, so we'll kind of make it fit what we already know or what we've been taught. And this is totally, this is a paradigm shifter, you know, to, to understand that uh, assemblies, uh, the ecclesia, you know, this breathing, living community of shared life and extended family that is so centered on Christ because someone from the outside came, uh, this is the apostolic work, and just drowned them in a revelation of Christ and then showed them how to know the Lord together and how to live by his life. That is, is such an exotically rare thing today um, that, you know, unless, unless a person has experienced it or seen it, it's very hard to really grasp it. And so we then fall on our filters like, oh, okay, well, then maybe they're talking about this. You know, I had a home group once and we came together once a week and we, right. you know, we had a meal together and we talked about, we prayed for each other. And, and maybe that's what, that's what Bible was talking about. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. And, and so, you know, one of the things that really helps is to read the New Testament not in the order in which it has been given to us, um, which came much later. <clears throat> the way that Paul's letters are arranged, for example, they're not chronologically uh, placed. They're placed by length. You know, Romans is the longest letter. Philemon is the shortest. That's why Romans is first in Paul's catalog and Philemon is last. Um, it's not chronological. But when you when you look at the whole story of the book of Acts, right, and you see what unfolds, and then you fill in the blanks with the epistles, especially Paul's letters, because Paul tells us things that happened that are missing from Acts. Luke, who wrote Acts, compresses the narrative. He abridges it. So he leaves a lot of stuff out. So if you're just reading, for example, I'll give you an example. If you're just reading um, Acts chapter 17, you would think that Paul was only in Thessalonica for three weeks, and that's how he planted the church. But that's not true. He was there a lot longer. He's probably there between three and five months. And we know this from reading First and Second Thessalonians. All right? And then we find out what he was doing there, because he gives little hints as to what he told the believers, these new converts that he brought to Christ, both from the Jewish community and mostly from the pagan world uh, in the city of Thessalonica, we get hints of what he taught them and how he showed them how to live by their spiritual instincts. For example, one comment he makes is he says, I don't have any need to tell you 
to love one another. You already do that. God has taught you how to love one another. I just want you to keep doing it and do it more and more. <laughs> so that's a little insight into the fact that he had introduced them to a Lord who indwelt them. And by instinct, they knew how to love each other. The Spirit showed them. Again, this is back to living by the indwelling life of Christ. So, yeah, that, that's just an example. But it really, it really hinders us because when we don't read the New Testament as a, as a narrative and we see it as a running story from beginning to end, and we see what Paul was doing and why he was doing it. And he just picked the baton up from the 12 who picked it up from Jesus. You know, it was a passing on of the torch, so to speak. Um, then we can basically take the New Testament and filter it through any kind of existing church structure that we have or that we've known, any kind of discipleship programs that we've experienced or that we've been taught about. And it be far removed from what we're actually reading um, because we're not reading it narratively, you know. And, and so that's just something I'll throw out there because I see that a lot. I mean, it was true for me for a long, long time. I mean, the, all the things I'm sharing with you, they hit me like a thunderclap and wreck my life. And uh, so what I have put in my books, my articles, the messages on, on our YouTube channel, on our podcasts are all unveilings of these things, uh, scripture by scripture, you know, text by text, but looking at it as a narrative. And um, that's the background to all of it. Awesome. Thank you, Frank, for uh, sharing that. Um, one last question before we hop yes. off. Yes, sir. Someone coming into the kingdom of God as a new disciple. What's one word of the word of advice you would give them? Man, that is a. That's a lot of question, a, but that's a golden question. Uh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. One word. I would say. Be careful who you listen to, be careful who you read. There are millions of books, millions of podcasts in the Christian world. There are millions of churches to choose from, millions of preachers and teachers to listen to. Find out who is giving you Jesus Christ. Now, by that I mean use that as your metric uh when i listen to this person am i seeing the lord jesus like i never have before is it taking my breath away am i saying wow what a christ um i have made the statement many times good preachers leave you saying wow what a good sermon or what a good message or what a good talk Great preachers leave you saying, wow, what a Christ. And if a person is giving you Christ, showing you Christ in such a way that your heart is just drawn to him, um, that your mind is just blown to the heavenlies, that you're just electrified by the Lord, that's an indication that that person really knows the Lord. And... Um, just because somebody preaches, some, just because somebody writes books, just because somebody has a podcast doesn't mean they really know the Lord well. And so I would say find people like that. Now, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of them out there, but they do exist. And you find a person like that and then just learn everything you can from them. I have a podcast episode, Patrick, on the Christ is All podcast, and it's uh, number 160. It's called The Peril of Listening to So Many Voices. And I would encourage people who are interested in this question that you asked and my answer to listen to that, because what I find is there's so much noise, right? And so many... Uh, people who put out content, whether it's sermons or podcasts or books or articles or blogs or whatever it is, there is so much noise that you can get lost or go off on these rabbit trails. And the only thing that really matters is what is my relationship to Jesus Christ? How can I know him better? How can I love him more? 
who exactly is him? Paul, who exactly is he in his fullness? We have terms like the fullness of Christ in Paul's writings. We have terms like the unsearchable riches of Christ. All right, all these things give us a clue as to the heartbeat of God himself. And the heartbeat of God himself, the almighty creator, is his son. That's who God the Father's passionate about. And then God the Son is passionate about his bride, his body. So learn from someone who is further down the road than you, who can show you Christ, and then who can also show you his body, his beautiful bride, his wonderful house, his family, in ways that you never heard before and in ways that really excite and enthrall you and touch your heart and touch your spirit and move you. That's what I would say. That's the number one thing. And I wish when I became a believer, I really started following the Lord hard at 16. I trusted him. I trusted in him when I was about 11, 12, around there. But I had my eyes open when I was 16, and boy, I was hungry and thirsty to know him, but it was like this seeker who just moved from one movement, one denomination, one Christian group, one tribe to another, to another, to another, to another, getting the best I could from each of them, but then it left me saying, there has to be more than this. Well, I found the more, brother, (laughs) and it it is the Lord Jesus Christ and his fullness and God's eternal purpose in him. And these aren't just terms. There's meaning behind it. And um, that's the problem with using words. You know, we can say one thing, uh, and a hearer will hear it completely different and fill it in with a, a completely different meaning. But that's what I would say. Find someone who can present Christ to you in such a way that you want more of him. That's a good amen. Thank you, Frank, for uh, coming on. I it's, it was a pleasure and honor to have you on. And uh, if you're still listening, thank you for listening all the way to the end. And yeah, if you want to check more, more of the content that Frank has, he mentioned some of the things to start you off with that he mentioned in this episode today. And yeah, and I just encourage you to, to check it out. And if we could just get a glimpse of the glory of Christ and who he is, it'll change everything in, in our lives. Amen. Hey, yeah, and if anybody wants to contact me or interact with me or avail themselves of any of the resources I mentioned, uh, they can just go to Frank Viola, all one word, frankviola.org. That's my website and it has everything on there, the books, the articles, the podcasts, et cetera. Um, but I would love to hear from somebody who's listening to this, who's listened to this. And um, if they want to interact, you know, I'm available there, but I appreciate it very much.